key findings, uh, which are very interesting series of findings, uh, and also um, a few top solutions are from Drawdown, just to give you a, an insight to the types of things that are most important for us to do. Um, so that's where it will go. And then at the end, of course, will be a question for you all to have a think about and uh, contribute on. So I've shortened this to one slide. The, the reason that for the need for drawdown is that uh, CO2 has always been, well, always during human habitation of this planet, has been in this range here from about 200 parts per million to about 300 parts per million. It's gone up and down with the ice ages. And the temperature varies almost perfectly in line with the CO2 content of the atmosphere. Um, so that's happened over the last 800,000 years for sure. And human, humans haven't been on the planet that long. So uh, that last 800,000 years have got ice records that show this fairly accurately. Well, go up beyond that, and that's where we are now with over 400 parts per million CO2 alone, but the trace gases uh, that also give us uh, global uh, uh, emissions. I have this interesting feature where my, if I brush my phone the wrong way, it turns on the music in my earpieces <laughs> from my phone. A handy feature when you're running, but not so good when you're talking on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're up around 500 parts per million when you take into account the trace, trace elements in the uh, atmosphere, uh, the equivalent greenhouse gas uh, effect, uh, which is way beyond our normal level. It's very lucky that we live on a planet that is very slow to warm or slow to... It was slow in human lifetime terms, but it's not slow in geological terms. It goes up and down quite a bit, but much slower than it's currently going. Anyway, so we've got to somehow stop adding to this, which is what we're doing every year at the moment. We're adding three parts per million, roughly, every year at the present. Slightly less this year, which is a really good thing, but still a, a lot will happen next year again if we're not careful. But we've got to stop putting that in, and stopping putting that in isn't going to put it back down to here all by itself. That's my concern. We know some ways of avoiding putting things in um, and we're working hard on that front some not as hard as they ought to be but we are working on it the issue is how do we draw it back down how do we get that co2 level back down to where it ought to be and will nature fix the problem for us and i've looked at uh, a few graphs uh, this is the carboniferous period over millions of years mother nature managed to bring down uh, uh, over 30,000 years, an average of one part per million reduction. Oh, sorry, that was per 30,000 years. Over 90 million years was the period that most of our coal was made. Mother Nature managed to get it down by 3,000 3, parts per million. So it can be, can be done, but like one part per million in 30,000 years, it's not real quick compared to us putting it in three parts per million per year. So, yeah, that's not real brilliant. Uh, maybe Mother Nature can do it quicker. So looking at the last uh, few hundred thousand years, based on ice records, which are pretty accurate, um, the best that Mother Nature can do, you can see it can drop CO2 quite quickly in, for short periods. It can drop it a long way over longer periods. If we look at that, that's 100 parts per million over 40,000 years. That's not real quick. That's only one part per million reduction every 400 years it's compared to our three parts per million in one year. It's not really quick enough, is it? If we take uh, just a very quick, short burst on this graph. Now, this is very approximate because this graph is pretty granular at that, uh, at that level. Um, but assuming that over a certain period from one dot to another on this graph uh, worked out to be 670 years based on this, because these are thousands of years we're talking about, here, hundreds of thousands of years. 
that works out to be about one part per million reduction in 33 years. But it's only for a very brief period, and it's not a hundred parts per million drop. Uh, so, I don't hold. Uh, and this is a period when humans haven't <laughs> destroyed all of the forests, uh, put uh, wonderful concrete jungles all over the best, most uh, fertile land that we have next to rivers, next to sea. So. Yeah, uh, not real confident that Mother Nature is going to fix this problem by itself. So we need a plan to reverse global warming. And this man, Paul Hawken, who's more a writer than a scientist, just knew some scientists. Uh, and each of the scientists he knew had different thoughts about their own technologies. But nobody really knew the answer to, well, what are all the technologies we need and how much of each one and what impact would that have? And so he pulled together a team to identify what uh, uh, what we needed to do and what were all the good things that we can do and what it would cost and what the benefits would be and whether we can actually solve this problem with all of them. So uh, I've just basically summarized this slide. I should have come here earlier, shouldn't I? So the thought is, though, halting emissions is achievable. Uh, and the estimates and expectations that they, they used are, I think, fairly realistic. The book tells you about what those expectations are. But it's not like we're expecting to switch to 100% electric cars in 20 years or whatever. It's actually expecting, I think it's only 50% of all cars by 2050 it will be, I forget the exact figure, but like it's a realistic sort of, uh, hope that we might get uh, a, the bulk of cars switched in that time. Um, and the same in most of the other uh, estimates that have happened. And they, this original book was published about three years ago. Uh, they've just published a review earlier this year called Drawdown 2020. And in it, they very boldly state that we can avoid catastrophic warming with the climate solutions in hand today. And I'm, I'd love to believe that they were true. The, the things I've seen haven't given me that feeling to date. But the figures show that, well, yeah, and I'll show you quickly those figures, show that maybe, just maybe, if we can do all of the things that are suggested, um, we could, in fact, achieve a drawdown. Uh, the the uh, project presents two scenarios, two main scenarios, scenario one and two, uh, basically aimed at two degrees of warming or one and a half degrees of warming. And, uh, and the, the difference between those is just how much uh, of each of these technologies we implemented, uh, how, many, how much we can implement, you know, how quickly we can implement those things. And so... Uh, this is the curve that we need to uh, stop. This is where we're currently heading. And it's interesting that this is an exponential curve that has kept going up even after, even after um, uh, Kyoto. The, our industries and the, what's been going on around the world has continued exponential growth up to this point in time. So it's really time we've got to turn this around. So we have to implement a whole pile of stuff I'd like to think this is possible. This is turning it around, moment of drawdown, about 2045, 2046. Can we do that? And these are the things, some of the things that we can do it with. Um, I'm just going to go briefly through the overall uh, types of things. But before I do, I'll explain that the, the numbers here relate to what's the, uh, what's the, uh, ranking of each individual technology or, or uh, approach. So this is number 42, and that is taken into account from uh, solution or uh, scenario two. Um, scenario one is slightly different figures, uh, and the order of things is just slightly different. But that's uh, uh, so. This is number 42, and it would reduce 
the amount of emissions over the next 30 years, between now and 2050, it would reduce things by 8.7 gigatons if we can just protect the forests to a certain level much more than what we are now. Um, and interestingly, the uh, wetlands and composting, these are all things that help. Uh, and overall, if we can protect uh, our e ecology a little bit better, we can, in fact, re uh, reduce our emissions so much more in the longer term as well. Uh, to put things in perspective, uh, we currently add about 36,000 tons, uh, gigatons, beg your pardon, 36 gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalent to the sky every year. So that puts these sorts of figures into perspective. Uh, those, these figures are over 30 years, and the 36 gigatons is one year. So that's not that uh, 36 is for the whole of that 50-year period. So building cities, alternative cement, uh, glass, cool roofs, and so forth, these are all fairly low ranking, although the cement is an important one. Um, water distribution, managing waste, uh, recycling, electric vehicles, one that's close to my heart. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't come rank all that highly, but number 27 is not too bad. For electric cars, or electric vehicles overall, and trucks. Uh, Working remotely, I missed that last one. Let's go back to that one. This telepresence is an important one that COVID's helped to helped us to learn about. The meetings like this, we don't need to move, we don't need to travel. Saves us time, saves us a whole pile of energy and fuel. Isn't that amazing? Um, then there's different forms of alternative energy, and I've, I've not put the top ones in this one, but. Uh, there are a number of different forms of energy sources that we can use. Energy of scale, again, these aren't the very top ones. Um, uh, and I, in my full presentation, I do all of the 21 top uh, uh, emission reduction options that we've got. Uh, I'm gonna pop through those that I think may be of interest to you tonight, just very briefly, stop at the starting from number 21 and working down to one with a few missing in between. So bamboo is a bit of a, uh, an odd one. You wouldn't have expected that might have been uh, a useful option to grow bamboo, but it's such a fast growing crop and it is a very effective uh, building material. It's actually stronger than steel in tensile strength per unit weight and it's stronger than concrete in compressive strength per unit weight. So it's actually a much better building material than what we often use for uh, our buildings. It's just a matter of how we use it. Uh, I, I think it's got a lot of practicalities uh, in other countries and we don't tend to use it quite as much, but we do see things made out of it. There are an awful lot of farming opportunities, uh, ways of using our land differently, regenerative animal cropping, tree intercropping, which is mixing trees. And surprisingly, this is quite a high, highly ranked one in comparison to others. Um, just the map, uh, planting rows of trees and rows of crops in between um, has a, an enormous benefit in terms of overall uh, productivity of the land. Managed grazing, where you don't uh, let cattle just roam over a large area, you keep them in a small area and move them from one small area to another. Let the grass regenerate for several weeks or a month or two before they go back there. And that does the, the ground so much more good. Uh, sequesters a lot more carbon. It's a lot of these uh, forestry and uh, farming practices will do. There's an awful lot of temperate forest that can be uh, restored. And it's not all land that's being used necessarily. It, it's uh, land that's just been cleared and is no longer being used. Tropical staple trees. This is an interesting one. Cropping, uh, in, uh, most farming is uh, using annuals. Uh, whereas if you have a, uh, a tree, products from a tree are far more 
stable in terms of the, the tree puts a lot more carbon in the ground, uh, keeps cropping every year, and there's lots of high-protein foods that can come from trees. So, so that's a good way to sequester. Tree plantations on degraded land, another form of forestry. Silvo pasture, having uh, herds in amongst trees rather than on open pastures, is actually a more productive way. You wouldn't have guessed it, but yes, and it's, got, it's happened for centuries. We've ignored the productivity of doing that. Alternative refrigerants. Now, this and the next one uh, were combined in the previous drawdown, and they came number one. But alternative refrigerants, uh, that's to use a different form of refrigerant. At the moment, the, the gases that we put in refrigerators and air conditioners is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas, thousands of times more uh, powerful than CO2. And if you've ever been to an Asian city, uh, one in the in the tropics generally, you see thousands and thousands of these little air conditioners and they're all full of this gas. And when they're decommissioned, they may or may not be properly decommissioned so the gas is taken out and reused or, uh, or destroyed um, properly. That gas leaking into the air is a real problem. So to, to go to a different form of gas in all our fridges and air conditioners is, the import, is an important thing. And also to uh, and, and also to manage the gases that we uh, we get out when we deconstruct. And you would have thought a place like Australia would be doing that. So when we decommission an air conditioner these days, you'd think we'd save that gas, make sure it didn't get into the atmosphere. Sorry, there doesn't seem to be. A, a, well, a lot of councils are doing that. At the tips, if you take a refrigerator or an air conditioner to them, they actually do properly remove the gas. But how about these split systems in houses that get demolished? How many people actually just cut them, let the gas out and take them away, demolish? Yeah, uh, it's a worry. It's a, and, you know, we didn't know about it. Uh, unless you've known, you wouldn't do anything. i better move on. Um, distributed photovoltaics and solar panels on individual home roofs. The really interesting thing he, here is that having your power on your own roof is enormously uh, effective, especially when you don't live near a grid. Uh, this family who live on a grass island in uh, Lake Titicana found it really good. Um, but that's, it works in Australia too. You think of remote communities, they're actually much better off with their own microgrid using their own power than they are trying to connect to a grid many thousands of miles away. Improved clean cook stoves. Now, again, this might apply, you wouldn't think, to Australia, but like when I go for my walk in these evenings, I, uh, I'm upset by the smell that I get, all these smoky uh, wood fires that people have going, that, hey, it might seem like an effective way to heat your house, but it's not really very good from a uh, pollution point of view. There are more effective ways and, and cleaner ways of uh, heating and cooking, and the cooking is more in the uh, undeveloped world. Uh, the problem there is they often use uh, cooking fuels that are not very, uh, not very healthy to burn. Forest restoration, it goes without saying, number six, tropical forest restoration. It's very high on the list. Plant-rich diet. This, this is the one uh, that I mentioned in the... Uh, in the promo, now you would think that shifting to 100% uh, 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 meat-free diet would be a, what we'd expect that we could all do. Yeah, well, I don't think we're going to get society to change that much. But if we uh, just balance things up, at the moment, the biggest meat-eating countries in the world, or per person, uh, are probably the USA and Australia, and uh, there are probably some European countries with pretty big meat eaters too. Uh, but it, apparently the worst case of any country is somewhere about 90 grams of uh, meat protein a day on average. We need to reduce that to about 45 grams of meat protein per day on average across the whole world. 
So all those who are currently not meat eaters are welcome to start eating meat if they want to, uh, to that level. So it's, it's not really an enormous uh, 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 thing to have to change when you think about it. It's not that difficult for us to learn to eat a little less meat. I've found it very easy. I've done that over the last couple of years. Yeah, but how do we change the world? How do we actually do that? How do we get Australians to start eating a little less? Yeah. Reducing food waste. Uh, who would know that we, we waste a, a third, I think it's a third of the food that we uh, we grow doesn't get eaten? Um, that's a terrible shame. And like you've probably seen the examples of this how do we use more of it? We're never going to use 100%. There's going to be some spoils and some things that don't work. We can do an awful lot better. And it's mostly those, uh, it's mostly the uh, highly developed countries where that food waste is happening. And of course, number two and number one are uh, what would have been the most obvious uh, to us in the first instance are photovoltaics, large scale, and onshore wind turbines. You might have noticed offshore wind turbines. Uh, rated quite a bit lower, but ranked about number 20. But as you can see, uh, have onshore wind turbines, the benefit there is that they're cheaper to put in. You can put them closer to your, your power grids and they're easier to maintain, uh, but they're also closer to where you need the power um, because uh, a lot of power is needed inland, not necessarily all on the coast. And that's an enormous amount of gigatons that we can save. That's the like four to, uh, at least four four years worth over the next fifty years. Uh, so they're the sorts of things we need to put in place to really conquer climate change. The uh, looking at the breakdown: electricity, food, agriculture, industry, transport, buildings. These are the quantities for. Uh, uh, both scenario one and scenario two. Um, and uh, there are some, these are technologies that reduce our uh, sources. There are sinks, land sinks are the basis of that, where we need to put a lot uh, of carbon back into the ground. And to improve society, of course, the big uh, elephant in the room is that our population growth and, and to have health and education uh, to the point where we have better family planning, better education of young ladies so that they, uh, uh, the, the trend is that uh, more educated people tend to have fewer children. Uh, and so that's the intent uh, to try and reduce our continued growth. Uh, sorry, I missed that last point. Of the total sum of all of these technologies under scenario two, is 1,576 gigatons saved um, as compared to 1,080 gigatons that we would put into the air otherwise uh, at the current rate, assuming we didn't keep increasing. So if we can stop increasing uh, over that period, We'd be that much better. You know, well, you get the idea. Anyway, it's more than we need, and it's actually taking the curve downwards, which is where we need to be. So the key insights, and I've got a little bit over time. Uh, I'll go briefly through these. They, drawdown's own insights here are we can reach drawdown by mid-century if we scale these solutions adequately. Solutions are interconnected, and we need all of them to achieve this. So we can't just focus on one, he's saying. Uh, they can, uh, they will contribute to a better, more equitable world, but a, a healthier world. You look, think about it, all, all of the emissions, most of the emissions are combined with unhealthy things. Us guys are so much clearer now since we've had less transport uh, thanks to COVID. Uh, that shows what we could have if we had electric transport for everything. Our atmosphere could be like that all the time. Savings overall significantly outweigh costs, but there are upfront costs, let's face it. We must accelerate these solutions. We're not doing them quickly enough. Emissions towards zero are one thing, but we also need support to support nature's carbon sinks. So it's not just 
zero emissions by 2050, we have to continue beyond that. We need to widen our lens, look at all the different options that are available to us. We have to look for accelerators. All individuals and institutions need to participate in this. There's, there's no uh, one rule for one and a different rule for another. And it will take an immense commitment. Uh, we need to make possible, uh, we may need to make uh, the possibilities a reality, as they say. So, interested in your thoughts on, on this. Uh, CCL is all about solutions. We don't look at problems, we look at solutions, is how we like to present ourselves. And uh, so, our current main solution that we, uh, we choose to promote is carbon fee and dividend. And that will help us enormously and is desperately needed in order to help stop the emissions that we're putting into the sky. But unfortunately, assuming we achieve by 2020, by 2050, uh, zero emissions, at that point, zero emissions implies that we don't have any more carbon going into the sky. So everything will be in balance and there will be no carbon fee because there will be no carbon. Uh, and so there will be no dividend and there will be no driver for going further. Well, we do need to go, keep going. We need to keep drawing down, implementing more technology and, uh, and, and helping Mother Nature draw this carbon back. And maybe now with the stimulus packages that are uh, uh, being looked at, maybe we need to promote some of the other technologies, not just uh, solar panels and wind power, so that we can uh, accelerate this whole thing forward. And maybe some of those things are easier to do uh, as a stimulus package. So maybe that's worthy of thought. So interested in, you know, these are sorts of ideas that I had. Do we learn about each solution and, and promote them to appropriate ministers? You know, take health and education to the appropriate ministers for those things. Do we take uh, um, uh, the food uh, wastage to the agricultural minister? Do we take... Uh, uh, meat eating to uh, who, who would we take that to can we get some of these things looked at in the stimulus package is there a magic mechanism like carbon fee and dividend that we could explore you know maybe uh, the methane that's emitted by animals in the, in the farm uh, maybe there needs to be a price put on that and, and discourage uh, meat eating through adding to the price somehow uh, yeah, so these are things that I thought we'd throw out there and get some ideas. So, uh, I can, if you're interested while we're talking, you can go off and have a look at uh, drawdown.org. And if you just click on solutions, it gives you, shows you all the different solutions. You can search on any one if you're looking for a particular solution to see what it says and where it's ranked. Um, so, you might want to take down that. that uh, that reference there, drawdown.org, and it will take you to you can click on solutions from there.